Orcs are one of the most recognizable fantasy races in the modern day. They're big, green, and mean. But what is the history of orcs? Not the specific lore for your favorite games, books, or movies, but the actual history of the race. Orcs, like many fantasy elements, can find their modern origins in the work of J.R.R. Tolkien. That's Tolkien, not Tolkien. There's an L there. When asked about orcs and their origins, Tolkien says in a letter to a fan, quote, The word, as far as I'm concerned, is actually derived from the Old English orc, demon, and he clarifies later in the same letter how they're the corruptions of normal creatures. The letter is number 144 and is linked below if anybody's interested. Now, the Old English word that Tolkien refers to is orch, which comes from the English translation of the epic saga of Beowulf. Beowulf was pretty foundational to fantasy since elves, ettins, giants, and dragons, as well as many more prominent monsters make appearances here. I recommend reading it if you're interested in the subject. In Old Norse, the word orch actually means Orkneus, which is thought to be the Old Norse way of saying Orcus, the Roman god of death in the underworld. He's basically Hades in the Roman beliefs, except far more evil. So, when they were initially created, orcs were not big or green. They were, in fact, sickly-skinned, corrupt little devil creatures. You can more compare the first orcs to modern goblin depictions, actually. Once again, this idea is actually from Tolkien. In Letter 144, the one from earlier, Tolkien clarifies that orcs were actually goblins, with the word orc being a translation of sorts of goblin. This translation was the idea he had in The Hobbit, which is why the word orc is only used once in the original printing. Orcs began to take their modern form at the introduction for the original rules for Dungeons and Dragons, or OD&D for short. In OD&D, orcs were taken more from Tolkien's latter works, and more specifically the Orakai from the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Orakai are stronger and more powerful orcs, and as strong as, if not stronger than, a man. Using this template, Gary Gygax and the other designers of OD&D made a clear distinction between goblins and goblinoids and orcs, with orcs being the larger ones. Now, during this time, orcs were more like tribal humans with dog faces and eventually made a playable race during the future releases of the D&D rules. During this time, though, another strange development took place, the creation of the half-orc. Now, half-orcs will likely need their own video in the future. Let me know if you want that in the comments below. The important part of them for the history of the orcs is that several half-breed races were created during this time, including the half-ogre and the half-orc. Now, the word ogre has a similar etymology as orc, and ogres deserve their own video again. Stay tuned for that one. That is coming. But, ogres were big, dumb, and mean brutes who are more similar to modern orcs. These half-races were made and published several times by a few different authors for D&D, which caused some wires to become crossed. Half-orcs actually were lithe assassins and could sneak and had better abilities as the thief class, but they turned into half-ogres because of a rule imbalance the half-ogres created. Because half-ogres were taller than most races, being close to 10 feet tall, they made them actually too strong for the game mechanics to handle. The designers wanted to keep the idea of being able to play a strong half-human, so they increased the strength of the half-orcs which led to increase in power of full orcs, and eventually inspired a group of game designers in London to finalize the modern orcs. In 1976, D&D was trying to find some partners in England to sell their products. They learned of a group of hobbyists running a fan magazine called Owl and Weasel, specializing in mail-order products. D&D's publisher sent a copy of their game to the magazine creators, who loved the game and began selling it immediately. They then launched a new magazine called White Dwarf to help promote this product. Thus, Games Workshop became an industry player in fantasy gaming. You've probably have heard of Games Workshop through either the video games or the miniature war games they produce. They make both the Warhammer 40k line and the Warhammer Fantasy line of products. We're going to be focusing on the Fantasy line today, which has been described as a darker and grittier world than typical Dungeons and Dragons or the Lord of the Rings universe which Tolkien wrote. Before it was solely a miniatures battle game, Warhammer Fantasy actually had some role-playing elements which appealed to both the audience and the designers of Dungeons & Dragons. In the first edition of Warhammer Fantasy, orcs are described as the largest of the goblins, being seven feet tall and having the long arms of an ape. They're also described as green and loving to fight. Remember that checklist of modern orcs from the beginning? Big, green, and mean? Well, now orcs are all of these. Modern orcs are sometimes still shown as stronger than humans. This is not true yet, 
as they only take less damage than the Warhammer system. Only when these green orcs are combined with the half-ogres of Dungeons and Dragons does the modern orc fully come into view. Zug, zug. Eventually, as more and more people became exposed to orcs through video games, their goblin connection was softened, and this actually led to a different race replacing the orcs in the goblin hierarchy, hobgoblins. They're another story for another time, though. One interesting thing to note, orcs themselves are always shown as brutes and evil monsters during this time, with only the half-orcs being able to break this mold. Full orcs were usually neglected as anything other than enemies for most of their history until the Warcraft game series. Warcraft is a game series that would eventually inspire the World of Warcraft MMO in the future. The original Warcraft was a strategy game, which was a conversion of the Warhammer Fantasy battle games where two or more armies could fight each other. Games Workshop pulled out of the agreement when the game was near completion, so an in-house universe was made. The Warcraft series is pretty well regarded for both its multiplayer and single player, something strategy games don't usually focus on. They tend to have only the multiplayer be the big focus, because that's more fun and what gets played more often. Now, the Warcraft games had their single player focus around being the humans, the good guys. They intended to have the bad guys, the orcs, be a multiplayer only faction, and have one single player campaign. The designers eventually realized some players preferred the orcs and needed a way to learn their unique traits before multiplayer, so an evil campaign was added where you play as the orcs. Luktar. At first, the games reveled in allowing the players to be a villain, causing destruction and just being a general menace, but eventually they wanted to tell different, more complex stories in their space. The campaigns forced the writers to make the orcs not just enjoyable, but sympathetic. This changes were the honor and tribal bands. The ritualized fighting and other positive cultural aspects of modern orcs were really added to their mythos. Other places had orcs as good guys before, but Warcraft changed the way people viewed the orcs. Warcraft's humanization is why many games in modern times have orcs as a playable race or side characters who are far more complex than their Tolkien cousins.